Hi, I'm Old North Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. In this video, what I'm going to do is present sample words in Old Norse for you to try to inflect in their forms, singular and plural, nominative, accusative, genitive, and dative. What I'll do is I'll write the word on the board and then have, have you pause the video. I'll say one, two, three, pause. Then you write out what you think the forms are and then I'll write out what the forms are and you can check yourself. It's the closest thing I can get to offering homework uh, when I'm just a strange man in your screen and uh, you're an actual human being looking at the screen. What I've got is two words in Old Norse in their dictionary form, that is their nominative singular, uh, with information that you can usually find in a dictionary. The gender indicated by a little m, a little f, or a little n to stand for masculine, feminine, or neuter, and often in parentheses the genitive singular and nominative plural endings. Not all dictionaries will list that information, and some dictionaries will leave it out if it should be obvious from the way the noun looks what type of noun it is. These two nouns, based on their gender, both have pretty obvious types, uh, if you know your Old Norse noun types well. So you might not see this parenthetical information because uh, it should be fairly clear if you know the language. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, say pause and then you pause, write out the chart for yourself and then restart the video and I will have the uh, chart written out for you to compare. So one, two, three, pause. How did you do? Well, if you look at Dauthi, it's a masculine noun that ends in I. You should be able to tell that's a weak masculine noun. So the accusative, genitive, and dative all end in A, ah, ah, ah. And then you have the typical masculine plural endings, ar, ah, ah, um. Dauthi means death, so I'm not too sure you would see it in the plural very often, since typically this is an abstract noun. But for the purposes of this demonstration, these are the forms that it would have. Bera, which means female bear, she bear, uh, has an A at the end and it's feminine, so even without the parenthetical information, which probably won't be there because this is a, it's obvious what type this is, it should be obvious to you that this is a weak feminine. So the accusative genitive dative will end in you, bera, beru, 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 and then we'll have you are in the nominative and accusative plural, beru, beru, we're going to have that N before the typical genitive plural A, berna, and then our typical dative plural ending, um. Here are two more nouns to try. First, there's horn, which means horn, just like it's English cognate. And then see if you can remember how to do soner, which means son, as in father and son. Ready? One, two, three, pause. How did you do? Well, you should be able to tell from the genitive singular ending S and the fact that there is no neuter plural ending that horn is just a typical neuter noun. So we have horn, horn, horts, horny, horn, horn, horna, hornum. It is quite possible that since this is a default normal type of neuter noun that you won't have the parenthetical information but that the dictionary will assume that when you see neuter and it doesn't have any kind of parenthetical information, that you'll assume that it works this way. How about solner? It's likely that a dictionary won't assume that you know how this noun works. Even though it's common, it is a little weird. So it'll probably put the genitive singular ending and then the whole nominative plural to remind you that it has I umlaut. When you see this, uh, noticing that the genitive singular is R and the nominative plural is IR, and that nominative plural ending causes I umlaut, that should give you a hint that this is a U stem. So, soner, son, sonar, but then of course this is an unusual noun. We get suni, sunir, we have to remember the I umlaut of U, not the I umlaut of O, and then sonu, sona, sonu in the plural. This noun really has to be learned kind of on its own, so it's worth practicing until you can get it right. Let's do a few more of these. All right, your next practice words are brother, meaning brother, a masculine noun, and sok, meaning thing, case, a feminine noun. Notice that I've written that vowel that I write as O, 
with a slash and an acute accent over it as an O and an E together uh, to remind you that those are the same vowel. They're just written different ways by different editors. And most dictionaries made in Iceland or the UK, which I suppose is most of the dictionaries that would be used in an English language uh, Old Norse class, will actually write it this way, even though I don't prefer that. All right, give it a shot. One, two, three, pause. Okay, how did you do? If you're learning Old Norse, you should usually remember that father, brother, sister, mother, mother, and dother all work the same way, and it's unusual. We have accusative genitive dative ur, just like is indicated here in these parentheses, and then we have the i umlauted root uh, with just the single letter r in the ending and the nominative accusative plural, brother, brother. Notice this is how I write this vowel. This is how a lot of other people write this vowel, but it means the same thing. Genitive plural, brethra, data plural, brethrum, a, um, just like most nouns. When you look at sok, thing, case, you'll see that it's feminine. It's got the typical feminine genitive singular in the ar, but you'll probably see in a good dictionary that the nominative plural might be ar or ir. That tells you that it can work as a true o stem with the earlier nominative and accusative plural ar, but that in later texts we're going to see it assimilate to the i stem plural with ir. So either one of these is correct. This is just earlier and this is later. That also means that if it's in origin one of these true o stems in, in early texts, you might see early texts where the date of singular is written with the u. But otherwise you'd expect sok, 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 and nominative accusative dative, sakar without u umlaut, and the genitive singular because there's, there was never a u to cause u umlaut. Sakir, sakir, and nominative and accusative plural, sakar, and earlier texts, and then saka, sokum with the a, um, genitive plural, and dative plural endings that we're used to. Now let's try something different with this one. Uh, now see if you can add the correct endings of the definite article to these two words. One, two, three, pause. How did you do? So now we have moved from brother to the brother, case to the case. So we add in, in, ins to the nominative, accusative, and genitive forms of the word brother. We add inum or just num to the dative singular. Often in masculine nouns, if it would make a four-syllable word, the I of the article does draw. We have near na added to the end of the nominative and accusative plural, brother near brother na, and then we have our typical na num added to the genitive and dative plural, brother na of the brothers, brother num to the brothers. In the word sok feminine, we have sokin the cause, the, the case, the cause, the thing, sokina accusative, sakarinar genitive. And then if we have that U in the ending, we're going to add the article ni without its vowel I to the U, so you get sokuni. But if you don't have that dative singular ending U, it's going to be added with its own vowel, the I, sokini. Earlier texts will have sakarnar, the cases, causes, things. Later texts, sakirnar. Notice that when the nominative accusative plural ending changes, becoming more like the uh, I stem plural that becomes more common for feminines, the article nonetheless stays the same. Because it's a feminine noun, article endings are always the same. And then our typical sakana sokanu. All right, let's uh, do some more of these exercises. Okay, your next two nouns to practice with are ervi, a neuter noun that means a funeral feast. We read about these very frequently in the sagas. And then hugr, a masculine noun that means thought. Give it a try. One, two, three, pause. How did you do? The neuter noun ervi is going to work like kvedi. You just add the typical neuter endings to the I. So ervi, ervi, ervis with the typical neuter genitive singular S added to that root that ends in I. Ervi with the I of the dative singular disappearing next to the I at the end of the root. 
nominative and accusative plural ervi, just like the singular because there's no vowel to u umlaut, and then our typical genitive and dative plural endings that we have for all nouns, a ah, and um. With hugr, you can look at it and see the genitive singular ar and the nominative plural ir in parentheses in most dictionaries. The fact that this ir is not accompanied by something that shows you that there's i umlaut, you know, something in the parentheses is higir, h-y-g-i-r, shows you this is probably not a u stem with all that umlaut phenomena, but a simple i stem. So if this is an i stem like stadr or vinner, it's going to be hugr, hug, right? You knock off that r for the accusative, just get the root. Gymnative singular, hugar, dative singular, no ending, hug. This being an i stem, these do start to assimilate more and more to our typical a stem masculine nouns over time. So don't be shocked if you run into this in an Old Norse text where the genitive singular is hooks with an s and there's a dative singular hugi. Especially in later texts, these may start to look like typical a stems. But then in the nominative plural, we get ir, and accused of plural i, hugi or hugi, and then the genitive and dative plural huga, hugum. Note that this word also comes in a weak flavor in addition to its i stem flavor. Uh, there's another word, hugi, and then that just works like a typical uh, weak noun, you know, hugi, huga, huga, huga. And of course, to recognize that from hugin, the thought name of one of Odin's ravens. Now, see if you can add the definite article uh, forms and their correct forms to these nouns. One, two, three, pause. How did you do? Well, in the neuter singular, we're going to add T to the neuter nominative and accusative singular, erbit, erbit. We're not going to bring the vowel of the definite article with us because this already ends in a vowel. We are going to have the vowel in the genitive singular because that form does end in a consonant, so erbisins. Ervinu, without bringing the vowel with us. Ervin, ervin, and our typical ervana, ervinu. With hugr, even though this is an I stem noun, not our typical masculine noun type, the article endings are still the typical article endings. So, hugrin, hugin, just like with the typical A stem masculine, these are the article endings. The thought, the thought. Hugarins, of the thought. Huginu. Often, I stems, for whatever reason, don't have the I in the article, even when you'd expect it on the dative singular. So you'll often see hugnum rather than hugenum. Uh, although I'm not sure the dative singular of this particular word is even attested, as it wouldn't come up much. Nominative plural, hugirnir, accusative plural, hugina, and then genitive and dative plural, hugana, hugenum, like we'd expect. So again, Nir, na are always the nominative plural and accusative plural article endings for masculines, regardless of the type of masculine noun. Right, so you have uh, a typical masculine noun in A-stem like el dar nir, the fires, but you also have hugir nir, the thoughts. Articles are the same no matter the type of noun, always the same for words of the same gender. All right, let's do a couple more. Okay, here are the last two practice nouns that I have time for today. Skjolder which means shield, a masculine noun, and bok, which means book, a feminine noun. One, two, three, pause. Okay, how did you do? Skjolder, by the fact that its genitive singular ends in ar, but it's masculine, and it has a nominative plural that's indicated with its full form, and that shows a mutation of the root to an i, that should show you that this is a U stem. You might also guess that it's a U stem based on the fact that there's U umlaut in the root, right? That breaking, that change to this, this vowel, O hooko, can only occur if there used to be a U in the ending. There was a U in the ending of the nominative singular in U stems in Proto Norse, so that's what caused it. So if you remember that it's U umlaut in the root uh, and it's a masculine, it's probably a U stem, that can be helpful too. So you get skjolder, skjold, dropping the R, the nominative singular for the accusative singular. Genitive singular, skjaldar, that ending has an A, not a U, so the root has the breaking J-A rather than j hooko. Notice that the actual root of this word is skeld, cognate with English shield. But just like fjorder, which is from the root 
Pero, every single case has a different vowel that changes that true root vowel, so we never see the true root scale. Right here, that E is broken by a U that used to be there, broken by a U that used to be there, broken by an A that's still there. We have this prehistoric change of E to I before an I here, and also in the nominative plural. Then we have breaking uh, by a U to J hooko, breaking by an A to J A, and breaking by a U to J hooko. So the forms are just like Fjordler. They are these strange Eustem forms that show all these fun umlauts and breakings. Bok is a feminine consonant stem. This is going to work like a no night. So we have bok, bok, genitive singular bokar. Also uh, in archaic writers, you might see bukar looking like the nominative and accusative plural with the i umlauted root vowel and then just an r at the end. Uh, but that's not common. Dative singular, typically just see bok. I don't think I've ever seen boku like you sometimes see no to. Bukur, bukur, nominative and accusative plural. We have i umlaut and then the ending r, and then our typical genitive plural and dative plural endings a, um, with no umlaut of any kind. All right, now see if you can add the correct forms of the definite article to these two words. How did you do? The masculine definite article looks the same no matter the class of masculine noun. So we get in, in, ins, inum, dropping the i from the article because the uh, noun already ends in an i. Skildernir, skildena, skaldena, skuldenu, near, na, na, nu, just like with any masculine noun. In the feminine, again, articles look the same no matter the class of feminine noun. So in, ina, inar, ini. We carry the vowel from the definite article and into each one of these forms because each of those forms ends in a consonant. Then bukernar, bukernar, bokana, bokanum, like we'd expect with any feminine noun. All right, well, I hope that these practices, our exercises, have been useful for you no matter how you're trying to learn Old Norris, whether um, from some of my videos or from one of my classes or from uh, a book like the New Introduction to Old Norris by Michael Barnes and Anthony Fox, or whatever it is that you happen to be using. Uh, I will possibly make more videos like this in the future, perhaps with some exercises and verbs, and then after I have done more of these um, grammatical overview videos, I'll start doing videos where we just look at a reading in an Old Norse text and we look at uh, how our knowledge of grammar will actually help us uh, read and make sense of real Old Norse texts. Well, for now, for the last time from the University of California, Berkeley, I'm wishing you all the best.